I will come to your house and bring you cash. I'm like, right. I love road trips and I've always had this quest for the perfect road trip car. I had owned a 1990 model BMW 5 Series. It's the car from the carjacking story, from the Tia with the Porsche story. And, you know, loved it. I eventually just beat it to death and sold it. But uh, several years had gone by and I started thinking about another car. Well, a buddy of mine and I that ran the Overland Company, we had sort of been involved in this motor trend project. They were building a track at Road Atlanta, a sort of temporary thing to off-road test several of the luxury SUVs of the time. This would have been the M-Class Mercedes and the Lexus RX something and the Infiniti Q something. You know, all those cars, all the Elemento P cars. And uh, in that test, now we had nothing to do with the test, but we just kind of consulted building the track, kind of showed them some hills and side hills and that sort of thing. But the BMW X5 did very well. It had the earlier hill descent control. It handled itself off-road better than a lot of these other cars. And you know, my wife and I at the time were looking for something that was comfortable, versatile, you know, sort of fast, sort of fun. I wanted to be able to take it off road. She wanted something that was fast that she could put some rims on it. You know, I wanted something that was fun to drive. And I had loved my 5 Series sedan. It was a right to drive. It was a manual transmission. Loved that car. So X5 it is. Sounds great. And this is in probably like 2003, 2002. So I start searching and, uh, you know, there were you know, still fairly expensive cars at the time, but I found one that was a really fantastic, just the most electric blue you've ever seen. And it was about $3,000 under market and it wasn't too far away from where I was. So I, I called the guy and I, you know, the guy had a very heavy Middle Eastern accent. So I started asking about the car and he said, well, you know, the car is fine. He said, I'm having a hard time selling it, uh, you know, because people hear my accent, they ask me if this is going to go to fund terrorism. You know, and this is only about 18 months to two years after 9-11. So I guess tensions were still high and the guy seemed like a delightful guy but he just seemed to be you know feeling like he couldn't move the car people were refusing to buy the car particularly because of his accent and i said well you know is the car okay he said oh it's it's great he said i just uh i just can't move it so uh i lowered the price a bit and i said well hey that works for me i'll come check it out so he gives me an address and i'm in athens i drive down to macon georgia i get to the guy's house and it's this really, really impressive gated neighborhood. And Megan's not really known for its wealth, but this guy must have had it all. This was a amazing house. The house is all white, all these beautiful white cars, you know, another nice BMW, another nice Mercedes, a lot of German stuff in the driveway. Fantastic house, you know, go up, ring the doorbell. It's one of those doorbells that rings for like 30 seconds, takes some big tune. And a very beautiful woman comes to the door, ushers us inside, and uh, the guy comes up to meet me. And he is dressed, you know, not fancy, but, you know, he had these kind of look like hand-woven linen slippers and kind of very billowy, kind of look like something like Ralph Lauren would wear on the beach. You know, had a lot of gold jewelry on. He had a cocaine nail about this long on his pinky finger. Delightful guy. You know, he's definitely got the sort of drug lord vibe about him, but he's, he's a very pleasant dude. And I asked him a little more about the car, and he said, well, what I do here is I buy these luxury SUVs in the United States, and I ship them to my brother in Yemen, and he sells them there, and we split the money. But this car was the wrong color. Tell me about the color. He said, well, you know, in the Middle East, uh, if you were somebody of prestige, you drive a, a white car, maybe a gold car. If you are a little lower down the social scale, you might drive a, a neutral, you know, a silver, gray, or a black car. But only the, the low-down people are going to drive, you know, blue or green or yellow or red. Those cars are not considered classy cars. It's like, okay, you know, so I take it out for spin. The car is fantastic. It's everything I hoped it would be. It's fast. It handles well. So we do the deal. I get the car. I drive the car back. Well, it was only a couple of years old, so I was still able to get the BMW extended warranty. Even though I bought it used, I purchased the warranty because, you know, there was some expensive stuff that could go wrong with this car. I get the warranty, and in very short order, little things just started going wrong with this car. Uh, now, it always drove, and it always drove beautifully, but it would just be, you know, window won't go up, window won't go down. Um, the you know, some the rain sensing windshield wiper thing loses its mind and the windshield wipers run nonstop every time a bird poops on it. Just little stuff like that. Uh, one of the more entertaining ones, the heated seat on the driver's side would not turn off. And, you know, I'll take you to the dealership and they're like, well, you know, it's not, we can't find a fault, so the warranty's not going to cover it. 
And, you know, we debated back and forth on that. And I was like, you know, figured out. They're like, well, you got to leave the car with us so we can figure it out. I'm like, well, you've had it for two weeks. Can we just, you do some research, call me back, because I can't really do without the car. So I'm driving around. I'm like, look, I'll just cut the wires to the seat. They're like, no, 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 you can't do that. If you do it, it'll freak out the computer system and this other stuff won't work. And I was like, oh, my God. So uh, I drive it, um, you know, get that sorted. What would usually go down is some random thing would go wrong with the car. I would call them. They'd want me to drop the car off. The car would sit there for two weeks until they got to it. Then they would try to fix it, but then they would come back to me and say, well, you know, our guy's been to Germany. He's got a lab coat on. This thing's just too complex. We can't figure out what the problem is. Warranty is only going to cover one thing. So you pay one and we'll pay the other one. And, and I was like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. So... They always ended up paying for it, but it always required me having to go in there two times, 10 phone calls, writing a letter, et cetera. So it was a little frustrating. You know, there was always some check engine light on, always some ABS thing. There's always some little fidgety thing wrong with this car. So after a couple of years of this, you know, I am just done with this car. You know, the heated seats won't go off. I'm driving around on a beach towel. I can't cut the wire because it'll freak out the ski package. There's always just some little thing. Now I'm trying to sell it, but I can't get the check engine light to go off. What can we do? They're, not, they're like, well, you know, just give it to us for two weeks and we'll run our diagnostics. We'll figure out what the problem is. I'm like, okay, fine. They call me back and they say, we've narrowed it down to one of three problems. They're each about $1,600. Warranty's only going to cover one. We'll pay that one and you pay the other two and problem solved. And I'm like, no, nah, it doesn't work that way. I just had enough. And uh, the service writer guy by the name of Mike... Um, was up out of his desk and I literally just sat down at his desk and I was like, Mike, every time this car breaks, I have to arm wrestle you, I have to arm wrestle your manager, I got to threaten to call the paper, chain myself to the door handle, something. And you always fix it in the end. Can we just skip all that and just get to fixing it? And he's like, nope, sorry. You know, the warranty only covers one thing. It's your car. You want it fixed. You have to pay the other two. I'm like, it's not going to work that way. I'm like, seriously, that's going to go down, Mike. I'm going to sit here in your desk. You're going to have to either drag me out of here, in which case you're going to have a fight on your hands, or you can call the police, at which point I will call the newspaper and we can all have a big discussion about it, or you can fix my car. So he stomps off, and I sat at his desk for about 45 minutes, and uh, this is, again, probably 2004, 2005. I don't have a smartphone, so I just doodling on his desk pad, and I just hung out at his desk for about an hour. So he comes back with his manager. The manager's like, what do we got to do to get you out of Mike's desk without a physical altercation? And I'm like, fix my car. You know, I gave you the money for the warranty. You said you'd cover the things. This is how it works. You know, you take my money, you deliver the service. If not, we got a problem. So as always, they agree to fix it. Problem solved, check engine lights off, and I get this thing on eBay Motors as quickly as I could. Now this is 17, 18 years ago, 15 years ago. This is before Auto Tempest and Bring a Trailer and Craigslist and all that. So I put it on eBay Motors. The truck looked really nice actually. We had put some, uh, you know, put some 20 inch rims on it, which weren't like the blinged out tacky kind. They looked the kind of the Alpinist style, you know, looked like they came with it from the factory, just kind of filled out the wheel wells a little better. The outside tire diameter was actually the same as stock. It was just more rim, less tire. So it didn't mess with the gearing or the speedometer or anything like that. Um, put a good stereo system in it. Uh, taking good care of the car. It was a great car, a great looking car. Nothing happens for a week. Hardly anybody even looks at it. So I relist it and within five minutes, I get ding, get a little email. Your item's been purchased with Buy It Now. And I get an email another minute or two later, you know, hello, sir or ma'am. Thank you for your item on eBay. I would very much like to purchase it. Will you accept check from Kazakhstan Bank? And I'm thinking like, all right, this is one of those foreign scam things, you know, not to profile anybody, but you know, obviously broken English and the foreign check, you know, this just sounds like a red flag. So I write the, the person back and say, you know, thank you for your purchase. As the auction stated, however, cash or a certified check from US bank only, you know, if you cannot accommodate this, please let me know and we can make other arrangements. I can relist the car. And the guy writes back and said, no, no, no. My brother lives in New York City. I was gonna come and visit him anyway. I will come to your house and bring you cash. I'm like, right. So I had a busy week planned. So I'm already in the back of my mind thinking how I'm going to have to arm wrestle eBay to get my $300 listing fee back. And I kind of put it out of my mind. But I'd sent the guy the address just for giggles, just to kind of see, you know, let's see how far he wants to take this scam. 
I'm sitting in my studio working on a piece of artwork, and my studio faced the street in my house. This was in Athens, Georgia. And I'm sitting there drawing, and a van pulls up in front of my house. I look out, it is the Hartsfield Airport parking lot shuttle van, which is 65 miles away from where we are. The shuttle van pulls up in front of my house, and two foreign guys get out. They've got shorts and tank tops, flip flops on, no luggage and a shaving bag with $28,500 in non-sequential 20s in it. You come to the door, hello, I'm here for the car. I'm like, wow, this is what I get for profiling people. I didn't expect to see you. It was the guy and his brother. He'd flown to New York, picked up his brother. They hopped a plane, flew to Atlanta, paid the guy from the Hartsfield van to drive them to Athens to my house, picked up the car. He was very insistent I count the cash, and I did. I, you know, laid it out on the counter and, you know, $28,500 in 20s, a pretty good stack of money. So I'm, sure enough, it's all there. And he was very insistent. I counted all. And he said, okay, you know, thanks a lot. We'll take the car now. I was like, uh, where are you, you taking it? He said, I'm going to take it to Savannah and put it on a container and ship it back to Kazakhstan. I was like, okay. I said, well, to be honest with you, I didn't expect to, to see you here. And, uh, you know, if I had known that a legitimate buyer was from overseas, I probably would have waved you off because... You know, uh, there's a BMW dealership right down the road, and I have difficulty getting this thing fixed here sometimes. Do you have access to a dealership or somewhere where you are in Kazakhstan that can keep this thing going? And he said, uh, you know, well, I know people. I was like, okay. And I said, well, I think it was like a Saturday morning or something like that. And I said, well, you know, I still owe a little bit of money on the car, and as the auction stated, you know, I need to get the title, ship it to you, so I'm going to take your cash, pay the car off, where can I send the title? And the guy says, ah, Kazakhstan, you have the car, you own the car. I was like, well, I kind of want to do something with it. He's like, ah, send it to my brother. You know, I don't really care. I'm just going to take it. I'm like, okay. So I take the $28,500 in non-sequential 20s. They get in the car and drive away. And I never heard another thing about it until about six months later, I got a letter from the, I don't know if it was the NTSB or whoever would oversee this sort of thing. And they basically said, you know, you sold a car, but it was never re-registered in the United States. What happened to it? And there was like a checkbox for like, you know, total per private collection sold overseas. So I checked the over sold overseas and sent it away. And I, I hope they had good luck with the car. The guy seemed like a delightful guy, but somewhere in the back of my mind, I know that thing is over there right now hooked to a team of horses with the check engine light on because they can't get it fixed either. Now, obviously at VinWiki, we love all of our sponsors, but first amongst equals would certainly be Auto Tempest. Not only have they supported the channel for the last three years, but they've made some of our favorite projects possible like Car Trek. It is honestly the first place that I look when I'm going to look for my next car. So these days that's about every morning. So we love Auto Tempest and it does make it easier than ever to find your dream car. They compile all the major listings from all the major sites into one easy search. Their motto is all the cars, one search and it certainly is a great tool for that. So be sure to check them out at the link in the description below and thank them for their continued support of VinWiki.